This day, let all stand still, in silence and in sorrow. Sun and moon, be still. earth, be still. still the waters, still the wind. let the ground groan. Let it weep as it receives what it thinks it will not give up. Time, be still. Let us pray. O oh God, we pray this day for all who have a song they cannot sing, for all who have a burden they cannot bear, for all who live in chains they cannot break, for all who wander homeless and cannot return, for those who are sick and for those who tend them, for those who wait for loved ones and wait in vain, for those who live in hunger and for those who will not share their bread, for those who are misunderstood and for those who misunderstand, for those whose words of love are locked within their hearts, and for those who yearn to hear those words. Have mercy upon these, O oh God. Have mercy upon us all. Amen. you to rise. The Holy Gospel for this day comes from the book of John, the 19th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. Then they took also his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. Lord, to whom shall we go? Please be seated. The reading from the prophet Isaiah is also titled The Suffering Servant, and it is the only description 
that we have of Jesus that comes from the Bible. The Lord says, my servant will succeed in his task. He will be highly honored. Many people were shocked when they saw him. He was so disfigured that he hardly looked human. But now many nations will marvel at him and kings will be speechless with amazement. They will see and understand something they had never known. The people reply, who would have believed what we now report? Who could have seen the Lord's hand in this? It was the will of the Lord that his servant grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing that would draw us to him. We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. No one would even look at him. We ignored him as if he were nothing. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God, but because of our sins he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserve. He was treated harshly, but endured it humbly. He never said a word. Like a lamb about to be slaughtered, like a sheep about to be sheared, he never said a word. He was arrested and sentenced and led off to die, and no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of the people. He was placed in a grave with those who are evil. He was buried with the rich, even though he had never committed a crime or ever told a lie. The Lord says, it was my will that he should suffer. His death was a sacrifice to bring forgiveness. And so he will see his descendants. He will live a long life, and through him my purpose will succeed. After a life of suffering, he will again have joy. He will know that he did not suffer in vain. My devoted servant, with whom I am pleased, will bear the punishment of man. And for his sake, I will forgive him. And so I will give him a place of honor, a place among the great and powerful. He willingly gave his life and shared the fate of evil men. He took the place of many sinners and prayed that they might be forgiven. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternity.
Oftentimes, we find it hard to accept the reality of sin, even though its existence is undeniable. Sin is the mysterious evil of the creature whose pride leads them to rise up against God. Except God is love. So it makes sense that the first word of Jesus from the cross is a word of forgiveness. But the forgiveness of God through Christ doesn't come only to those who don't know what they are doing when they sin. In the mercy of God, we receive God's forgiveness even when we do what we know to be wrong. God chooses to wipe away our sins, not because we have some convenient excuse and not because we have tried hard to make up for them, but because God is full of grace. The void of wickedness which sin opens wide has been bridged by God's endless compassion and immeasurable generosity. The result of this intimate relationship of love is that God's very self takes on our human condition and bears the burden of our wickedness to end up affixed with nails to a piece of wood.
before you die, Jesus, and the world goes into deep darkness, take from our lives, from our souls, from our consciences, all that has offended you, all that has hurt others, and the apathy which has made us numb to the pain of those whom we could not help or heal. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. All you who pass this way, look and see. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. As Jesus was dying, his mother was among those who had remained with him. Most of the disciples had already fled, with the exception of the one referred to only as the disciple whom he loved. But no matter who this beloved disciple was, it's clear that Jesus was forging a relationship between his mother and this disciple, ensuring that both would be in good hands after his death. In his last moments on earth, Jesus is concerned not with his own condition, but with the accomplishments of his mission and with the welfare of those he leaves behind. Mary is there, hearing with immense sadness how the soldiers and passers-by curse and mock her son. She is united in his suffering. She is experiencing the full responsibility of her yes, spoken to an angel in Nazareth, what seems like a lifetime ago. But what could she do now besides offer her immense sorrow to God? The presence of Mary at the cross reminds us that Jesus was a real human being, a man who had once been a boy, who had once been carried in the womb of his mother. Even as he was dying on the cross as the savior of the world, Jesus was also a son. For the moment, Jesus is comforted by the quiet, loving presence of his mother. Mary does not shout. She does not run around frantically. She is just there with her son in the midst of this agonizing nightmare.
Before you die, Lord Jesus, hear us for our families, where they are open, loving, supportive, that their joy might be kept safe. For our families, where they are tense, troubled, fragmented, seething with suspicion, that they may find a way through the pain, not a path away from it. For our churches, where they risk welcoming the stranger, that they may be encouraged and surprised by joy. For ourselves in this place, surrounded by people whose journey we have not traveled, whose depth of faith we do not know, whose potentials we cannot imagine, that we might somehow know we belong to each other. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. One of the most excruciating experiences in life is to be left out, unwanted, cast aside. How naive we are to assume that the thief on the cross did not know the pain of rejection, especially when we have his own admission that he deserved execution. And yet, this criminal who hangs next to Jesus experienced love mercy and forgiveness just before he dies. Imagine the man's shocked reaction when Jesus looked at him in the eye and responded with words that seemed too good to be true. Today, you will be with me. You and me? You can't be serious. A king and a convicted criminal? The savior of the world and the scum of the earth? In paradise? Together? The man had to be thinking, why would Jesus want to spend time with me? After a life of being cast aside, the man alongside Jesus decided to take a chance and react against his weaknesses with an act of faith. And by God's overwhelming grace, he will die in peace and enter paradise with Jesus at his side.
before you die, Lord Jesus, remember us. Not for our impressive accomplishments, nor, nor for the things we hope will appear on our gravestones. Remember us not for the virtues we sometimes display or for any credit we think we have in our moral account. Remember us as one of the criminal community who hung at your side. And if life will not let us be in paradise with you today, keep a place for us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The disciples, once at his side, are nowhere to be found. The people he once healed of their illnesses, the lame, the blind, the lepers, where are they? Where are all those he welcomed and accepted when no one else would? And what about all those who had been following him? Not a single one acknowledged him. And what about God? Why had God abandoned him? Why would the Father turn his back on Jesus in his moment of greatest agony? In his final moments, Jesus is surrounded by a deafening silence. We too may someday feel the loneliness of our Savior Jesus on the cross. Throughout our lives, we may encounter moments when we find ourselves crying out to God, where are you? If only you had been here, why didn't you do something? God placed the sins of the entire world on Jesus which fell heavy on his humanity. Jesus was bearing the weight of our sin and God's wrath for that sin. And in doing so, Jesus entered into the hell of separation from God. In that excruciating moment, he experienced something far more horrible than physical pain. The beloved Son of God knew what it was like to be rejected by the Father. As Jesus was dying on the cross and experiencing the fullness of human emotion, he echoed the beginning words of Psalm 22. His only consolation would come in the words of this familiar prayer that begins with discouragement and ends with joyful hope.
Before you die, Lord Jesus, by your cry of desperate honesty, rid us of shallow faith, which is afraid of the dark. Not so much that we might be justified in our pessimism, but so that we might discover profound joy. Give us, when we need it, the courage to doubt, to rage, to question, to rail against heaven until we know we are heard. We do not ask for an easy answer to hard times. There are many who can offer these. We ask for a send of your solidarity. That will be enough to let us know that we do not walk or cry alone. That will enable us to go through the dark and find light again in the morning. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The moment when Jesus says, I thirst, and is given a sponge soaked in vinegary wine, is more complex and more compelling than it might first appear. But there should be no doubt with what Jesus has already endured, that he would have experienced extreme thirst while being crucified. Jesus was suffering for the sin of Israel, even as he was taking upon himself the sin of the world. But there is so much more to Jesus' thirst. He is not only experiencing physical thirst, but deep inside he is thirsting for us. Jesus thirsts for us to unlock the doors of our hearts and minds. Jesus desires for us to thirst for the things of God. And he longs to meet us in our deep yearning and quench our thirst. When we encounter these words, we might imagine that Jesus is addressing these words to us. I thirst for you to be faithful in your promises to those you love. For you to be honest, humble, generous, merciful, kind, patient, forgiving. I thirst for your heart.
Before you die, Lord Jesus, remind us that you have made us for yourself. We know it even if we cannot name it. We have had these bodies and minds long enough to learn to live with our limitations. Yet despite this, something in us hungers and thirsts for something better, something greater, which we know is there. Beautiful music ends and we wish it could continue. We embrace, then refrain from embracing and wish that we could be held forever. We sense the disappointment and dashed hopes that deserve to be fulfilled in missed opportunities, in people whose potential has been buried or denied and deserves to flourish. So much of life demands a resolution. Thank you for giving us enough of you to want more and to sense the fullness of eternity within the limits of time. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. When Jesus said, it is finished, surely he was expressing relief that his suffering was finally over. The body and blood of Jesus speaks to us of a self-sacrifice brought to the last extreme. It is finished. Everything is completed, mission accomplished for the sake of love. The source of all grace is God's love for us. And this love is revealed in the redemptive journey which Jesus made on our behalf. A journey that culminated in the supreme sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Because Jesus finished his work of salvation, you and I don't need to add to it. In fact, we can't. He accomplished what we never could, taking our sin upon himself and giving us his life in return. Jesus finished that for which he had been sent, and we are the recipients of his unique effort. Because of what he finished, you and I are never finished. We have hope for this life and for the next and we can live with the reassurance that nothing can separate us from God's love.
Now, Lord Jesus, you can let go of us. You have convinced us of our sin and you have forgiven it. You have convinced us of your way and have engaged us on it. You have shown us a foretaste of heaven and have made us members of the kingdom of God. You can let go of us now. Having overcome the sin of the world, death will be a small obstacle. Just as you foretold that you would be handed over to be crucified, and this has come true. Also, as you foretold on the third day, you will rise again, and we will be your witnesses. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Darkness encroaches. The story, it seems, is over. With a final word entrusting his spirit to God, Jesus surrenders to the pain and his mortality. 
giving everything according to the will of the Father, and dies. The cross of Christ has amassed all the arrows of evil. God is hanging on a tree. In the broken body of a young man, arms outstretched to embrace us and gently asking us to climb up onto the cross with him and look at the world from an entirely new perspective. Jesus bows his head and hands over his spirit to his Father for all of us. Jesus conquered our sinfulness by dying on the cross, and by giving his very life, he showed us the true meaning of love. This glorious moment proclaims that the past is finished, and a bright future is open to all. The crucifixion points to a path of hope and a never-ending future with God. Go, silent friend. Your life has found its ending. 
to dust returns your weary mortal frame. God, who before birth called you into being, now calls you back, his accent still the same. You cannot cling to life forever, nor can we cling to a dying frame, nor do we grudge you that peace which passes all understanding which you have promised us. So go to heaven, where you will welcome those who die in the faith, whose death with your death we remember. Tell them that we love them, that we miss them, that they are not forgotten. And cheered by the prospect of a day when there will be no more death, and all shall be well, and all shall be one. May they who have died before us be the first to welcome us to heaven. Until then, keep us in faith, fill us with hope, deepen us through love. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. If you are near to one of the candles in the congregation, I would invite you to rise and blow it out, please. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. <laughs> 